uh, I have a red cardigan sweater vest that my wife's mother knitted, uh, and I, she wants me to wear it to one of these sermons. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I could take my shoe off like Mr. Rogers, right, and switch... We talked about that, but anyway, you know, watching that video, uh, you may not know this, when we record these videos, I have to talk much slower in, on video than I'm comfortable talking, and it reminded me the first sermon I ever preached in this room, I won't tell you who it was because he's here this morning, he'll know, I preached the sermon and he came up to me and he said, young man, I'm sure that was good, but I don't hear as fast as you talk. <laughs> So I'll try to, don't applaud for that, I'll try to slow it down now. <laughs> and hopefully I'm slowing down. Let's pray together and ask God to speak to us at whatever speed through his word. Lord God, we, we need to hear your word. And I pray that you'd remove anything that's in my way or our way from hearing from you. Because your word is living and active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It can even pierce our thoughts and our intentions. And so we ask you, Jesus, who are the living word, to speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, you saw the, the intro video there. We're in a series called Won't You Love Your Neighbor? And we've been studying not the wisdom of Fred Rogers, although he had some good things to say and certainly made an impact in his uh, career, at impacting generations. We're looking at where did Fred Rogers get those ideas, those transforming ideas from. They weren't his own. As many of you know, he was an ordained Presbyterian minister. He got them from Jesus. You could say it different ways, but the central thrust of, Fred, of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was love for neighbor. And we've been exploring what does that really look like for us. Last week, I talked to the Kessler campus and about being with some young believers uh, in, 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 outside of Toronto at a church we visited there. And some of these young people, these young women said, we're going to stop calling ourselves Christians. I said, well, that's interesting. You're in a church. You work in a church. Why? And she said, well, our friends, our generation see that as something political and ugly. We want to call ourselves Jesus followers, okay? Historically speaking, that's what Christians are, have always been. In Acts eleven 26, we're told that the believers were first called Christians at Antioch. They were given that name by the Greeks and Romans who didn't know what to call them. These people who followed Jesus, these Christ ones, the word from Christianos in Greek, it literally means Christ ones. We don't know what to call you, so you're Jesus people. You follow Jesus, we'll call you that, Christians. That's what the name means. Well, what do Christians do? We follow him, Christ. And that's at the heart of what it, this series called Won't You Love Your Neighbor? When Jesus was asked, what's most important? What's the greatest command? What does it boil down to? We talked about this several weeks ago. He said, well, it, it comes down to two things. Love for God and love for neighbor. And we're going to look here uh, at that command briefly, and then at the parable known as the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I'm going to, it's not much of a guess here, go on a limb that you've heard of that before. I think the parable of the Good Samaritan is perhaps the best known, but the least practiced, and perhaps even the least full, truly understood of Jesus' parables. We all know the title. We know the basic outline. We have hospitals named Good Samaritan. We have Samaritan's Purse. We have ministries named after Samaritan. But we, I'm not convinced that we always understand the depth of this parable. But I have not always understood the depth of it either. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 25 through 37. Now I should say that this first section here, 25 to 28, is what we call the great commandment. This is, there's two other places in the Gospels, in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12, where Jesus himself gives this commandment. He's asked there by an expert in the law, what's the greatest commandment? And he gives the same answer. Luke's got a different, uh, a different encounter. It's very similar, but in this case, Jesus puts the question back on the man asking the question. Let's read and see verses 25 to 37 here. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, 
who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you. When I come back, I will repay when I come back, excuse me. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Again, very familiar passage, I'm going to guess, for most of you. The questions of this lawyer here, and by the way, I know you, many of you know this, but in case you're newer to reading the Gospels and understanding, when it says lawyer, some of your Bibles might say expert in the law. It doesn't mean civil law or social law. It meant the Old Testament Torah, the law of God. This is a religious expert. And he, this man st- stands up to ask Jesus a question. He's standing, a sign of respect for a rabbi. The rabbi sat to te- would sit to teach, and the disciples would stand to ask questions or, be, or answer them. But his standing is not in line with his intent. He's showing respect by standing, but he's actually asking the question to trick Jesus, to trap him, to test him, to expose him. So he's not exactly, his heart is not lined up with his actions and his words, is my point. He asks him this question, what's the greatest commandment? What's most important? And he phrases it differently, doesn't he? He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's how most people think about it, isn't it? About religion, don't we? There are certain things you got to do and a whole bunch of things you better not do if you want God to bless you, to let you into heaven, to not put you in hell, to give you life, whatever it is. And that's how this man phrases it. What must I do? And Jesus, being Jesus, asks what I'm going to call a crucial question. A crucial question here. He puts it back on him. He says essentially, you tell me. You're the expert. How do you read it? Now, when he says, how do you read it, he doesn't mean recite it, because this man probably could have recited it. What he means is, you sum it up for me. And this expert in the Old Testament Jewish law gives the right answer. He quotes two Old Testament verses. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 5, what we call the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And then he quotes Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, bingo. He doesn't say bingo, but you get the idea, right? He says, good answer. You got it. Do this, and you'll live. Just do this, and you'll live. Conversation should be over. He asked a question. Jesus put it back on him. He gave the right answer. Good job. Let's move on. Next. It doesn't end there. It does not end there at all. What comes next is where we're going to focus. By the way, just a little personal note. Don't try to test Jesus with uh, questions about the law that is his to begin with. Don't play games with the most important questions with Jesus. This man's an expert in law. Let me read the exchange again one more time. Verses 25 to 29. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Can you hear the disconnect between the seemingly important, sincere question and the man's, what he's really after? He, Jesus, said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. And then verse 29, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now it's easy to miss that. Why does this man want to justify himself? What justification does he need? He just gave the right answer. Right? Jesus said, that's right, that's right. You got the right answer. Do this and you'll live. Why does this man feel any need to justify himself at all? Because he knows the weight of what he's just said. He know, he's an expert in the law. He understands the significance and the weight of what he's just said. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes, do that. 
That's the path to life. Remember the question? Eternal life, life with God, the life that God desires, the life that God blesses. That's all you have to do. That's it? That's it. Simple, really. Why does he feel he needs to justify himself? Well, which of you doesn't? I do. If Jesus put that to you, do this and you'll have that life. You instantly know that you cannot. You instantly know you can't do what he's asking you to do. And this man knows it, which is why he wants to justify himself, which is why he asks this question, which sets up the whole story, which we'll unpack. You know, you can feel pretty good about yourself when you see the law as a set of rules to follow and you're keeping track of how good you're doing, you know, like God's grading you on a curve or something. When you start to realize what the law is really after, it's after your heart, your motivational center. This is why he wants to justify himself. He says, what's his question? Who's my neighbor? Think about that question for a minute. And who is my neighbor, Jesus? How far does this actually go? You don't mean love everybody. By the way, Leviticus 19.18, he quotes the last half of it. The first half of that verse says, do not hold a grudge against the sons of your own people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The typical Jewish understanding of that teaching was, you love your fellow Jews. You love your Israelites. You love the people that are inside the covenant family of God. That's who you love as yourself. Pagans, Gentiles, those outside the family in favor of God, they're in a whole different category. And clearly Jesus, being a rabbi, teacher, you don't mean love them. You don't mean everybody. He, this guy thinks he knows what the answer is already, doesn't he? My people. My kind of people. Not the people who put the wrong kind of yard sign in their yard, right? Supporting the wrong kind of candidate. You don't mean love them, do you? I mean, do you ever drive, do you ever, how many of you, not the show of hands, but you could just, I could tell by looking. How many of you drive by somebody's yard and you see a sign, a, pol a political sign, and you instantly make a judgment about what's going on in that house? What kind of people those are, right? How far does this go, Jesus? And I'm talking about either side of the aisle here, right? We both do it. And I know that because you both email me asking why I don't talk about this, right? <laughs> how far does this go? Who, who do I have to love? What's the extent of this? Your friends, your family, people like you, those are your neighbors. Well, Jesus, in answer to this, being Jesus, says, that reminds me of a story. He doesn't say it that way, but that's kind of what he does. He goes, I just love that. The guy says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus goes, a man was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. <laughs> Settle in. We're going to have a story, children. Verse 30. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. This is a transforming tale. It's a story, a parable, as you, some of you know, comes from a Greek word, parabole. It means to cast alongside of. It's an agricultural term like casting seed. Jesus would throw these stories alongside of spiritual truths to illustrate things to us. Some of the deepest things about life with God and his kingdom are not things that you can uh, define in a bullet point list. They are things that you must describe in a transforming story, which is what Jesus does here. Tells a story to get to our hearts. C.S. Lewis talks about why, was once asked why he wrote children's st stories. He says t they are the sometimes fairy stories say best what needs to be said. They get past the watchful dragons of the adult mind and heart. Do you love that line? We have these judgmental, these judgments, these preconceived notions, these, we call them watchful dragons, that prevent us from hearing the truth. And sometimes stories can sneak past our defenses and get inside, which is why I think Jesus told those stories. And I'm guessing you have some of those watchful dragons. One of them is you presume to know this story already. Yeah, yeah, I know. Be like the Samaritan, not like the priest and the Levite. Be a good person. I've heard this a thousand times. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to set that watchful dragon aside and hear the story in a, in a fresh way. So first, a little context here. This, this road is a real road Jesus refers to. It's the Jericho Road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It, it's 17 miles long, and it really does go down. It drops nearly 3,200 feet in elevation in those 17 miles. You'll see a map here from near the Dead Sea, Jericho, uh, back up to Jerusalem. Now the man's walking in the opposite direction, so he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So it's about a 17-mile journey. He's descending 3,200 or, or so feet in elevation on that journey. It's a difficult road. I've, uh, the last section of it, some of you may have been to the Holy Land, is what we call the Wadi Kelt, as you get near Jericho. It's this ravine with this river there. 
you'll see an image here of that part of the road here. My wife and I, with Pastor Brian and Lorene, uh, walked that very section of the road. We were standing at the top and took a photo of that. Uh, actually, that one's off the internet. The next one is the one I took of the St. George Monastery. This is the Monastery of St. George, a Greek Orthodox monastery built right into the side of the mountain for wayfarers, travelers that may, may need help and, and, uh, and, a, and an opportunity to be blessed and worship there. You can go inside, it's open to the public, it's a remarkable place. But that's on this road. It's a dangerous road. Sections of it's known as the way of blood because so many individuals traveling alone would get attacked there. So Jesus tells a story that everybody knows, would be familiar with. Oh yeah, we know that road and this guy shouldn't be walking alone. This happens. He sets the story in real, tangible, familiar place to his audience. Now, I want to ask a question. In every culture, how do you know who are your kind? Any of you travel outside of the U.S.? How can you pick out the Americans? <laughs> when, you get, when you go to France or Germany or Italy, how do you know? Well, the cameras are on their neck, right? <laughs> Loud, obnoxious, th their language. You can, you, by what you see and hear. Their behaviors, what they say, and you, it's obvious, right? You can tell. Well, this man is what? The man in need is stripped, so you can't tell by his clothing who he is. He's unconscious, left for dead, so he's not talking. How would you know who this guy is? Is he a Gentile? Is he a Jew? Is he, what, of what class is he, socioeconomically? The, he could be anybody, which is kind of the point. He could be anybody. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Now it's easy, in verse 31 to 32, we see the priest and the Levite part. I'm going to just read that. It won't be on the screen. Let me just read it for you. The priest and the Levite here. Verse 31. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. Two verses, a couple sentences, very simple, very easy to miss this, and it's, I think, I have been guilty of being awfully judgmental toward the priest and the Levite when I've read this story over the years. Those guys are jerks. How can they just pass by and leave this guy on the other side? How can they just ignore him? A half-dead naked guy lying in the road. Well, there's a number of reasons. And before we're too quick to pass judgment, I remember years ago, uh, I was, we had some guests after a church that had come, were at our home, and my son Benjamin and I went to Portillo's to pick up lunch for our guests. It's a nice thing to have, Portillo's, on a Sunday afternoon. So we had a big giant order, we, and, I, and we got through the line. They do a remarkable job of getting you through that line pretty fast. We had all these bags, and you'd smell of French fries in the car, which I no longer eat, much to my chagrin. But anyway, in those days, I was eating lots of French fries. And Ben is sitting next to me, and he's digging through the bags, looking for it, making sure the order's there, and eating the fries, which you do when you're a young kid. And he notices we have two extra hot dogs. Dad, two extra hot dogs. It's like winning the lottery when you're, you know, seven years old. <laughs> two extra hot dogs, right? So we pull up to the corner, uh, crossing around the road, and there's a guy on the corner of the street holding a sign, sitting on a duffel bag, looking hungry and homeless. And I didn't even, didn't even, hardly even notice, didn't even register. And Ben said, Dad, Dad, look at that guy. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, waiting for the light to turn. Dad, we have extra hot dogs. Oh, yeah. And didn't even register. Dad, we can give him our extra hot dogs. I'm like, and before I could say, Ben, don't get out of the car, it's you know, busy. He jumps out of the car with two hot dogs, goes over to the guy, gives them to him, and I'm looking at uh, thinking, uh, you better get the lights going to turn. Get back in the car, buddy. I'm just annoyed. He gets in the car. We drive on, and he looks at me. And he goes, Dad, it feels good to do the right thing, doesn't it? <laughs> I was like, yes. Yes, it does, son. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that lesson, right? We all pass by in a thousand ways every week. But why this priest and Levite would pass by? Well, first of all, the, the priest is not walking. He's probably riding. And the reason he's, he's going from Jerusalem, where the temple was, to, on the road to Jericho, is he's likely headed home. The first century hearers would understand this. He's probably done his two-week stint in the temple. The temple was a massive place. It took hundreds of priests, and they came from the surrounding villages to come and serve for two weeks and go home for a couple of months and go serve two weeks and go back home. And so he's probably done his two weeks of service, and he's headed back home. He's headed home with his payment, and he was paid in part of the sacrifice and food uh, for his family. So he's headed home with, the, with his payment. And if he stops to help this guy. He doesn't know the robbers could be nearby and he could cost him everything, what he's just earned at the temple. 
They could still be there. Second, if this guy is dead or dies in the process of helping him, some of you will know this in the Levitical law, the priest becomes defiled by touching a dead body, which means he has to turn around, go back to Jerusalem, go back to the temple, see his other priests, his colleagues, kind of embarrassing that you've been defiled now, and has to go through the rituals of being made clean. They're going to look at him like, you should know better. What were you doing getting defiled on your way home? So he, he passes by. It's risky to stop. And it might even be breaking the Levitical law, of which he's supposed to be a keeper. So we can maybe have a little more sympathy for why this man would pass by, why he would not stop. And the Levite, and if you ever wonder what a Levite is, a Levite is like a, he's lower class than the priest of the same uh, tribe uh, of Levi and Aaron, but but of a lower class. He's like a junior varsity priest, but never going to make varsity, if that makes sense. Right? He's just, and so he assists the priest in their duties. He's lower class, so he's absolutely walking, not riding. And remember, the road goes down. It's entirely possible that in this story, the Levite being behind the priest sees what the priest does and goes, well, if the priest doesn't stop, why should I stop? I, am, I, I don't have what the, what the priest, I don't have his resources, and he passes by. Can you see, potentially, how a person's religion could get in the way of them performing an act of love? And can you see how somebody else, watching somebody else who's religious, would follow and get in the way of them performing an act of selfless love? There's a lot of the priest and the Levite in each one of us. They pass by. They don't stop. They're both bound by the same law. Let's read verses 33 to 35, because now the story turns scandalous. But a Samaritan. If you'd like to highlight or underline, circle that one. Jesus is a master storyteller. The priest, the Levite, passed by. But a Samaritan. Collective gasp in the audience listening. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, that's two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and I'll pay whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Now the story really gets scandalous. A Samaritan? A Samaritan. Of all things, Jesus is Samaritan. Now, some of you know your Old Testament history. Uh, in Jesus' day, Samaritans were hated by the Jews. And this goes way back to the time of Ezra. Uh, they were considered half-breeds and traitors to their Jewish brothers and sisters. And for their part, the Samaritans hated the Jews right back. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well that has this exchange with Jesus, and she says that our prophets tell us this, and he says, I'm the one that you're talking about, right? She was from this class that was hated by the Jews, so Jesus had a double reason not to engage with her, but he does anyway. Now, uh, during the Assyrian captivity, some Jews stayed behind in the region of Jerusalem and in Israel. And those that did intermarried with, their cap- with, with the pagan nations uh, and began to worship what the Jews believed was a, a false god, a, a corrupted version of Yahweh worship. And then when the exiles returned... From captivity, generations later, those that had stayed and intermarried and worshipped a corrupted, perverted version of, of Yahweh worship were viewed as these less thans, these, these corrupted, half-breed traitors. Over time, this is, the division, this is the root of the division between Samaritans and Jews, though they shared the same ethnic line, origin. They hated each other. There's a saying in the Mishnah that to eat the bread of a Samaritan is the same as to eat the flesh of swine. And if you know anything about Jewish law, they don't eat the flesh of swine. Actual prayers asking God to withhold his grace from Samaritans in the Mishnah. Think about that. God, send your grace. But not to that guy, right? Not to them. A good Samaritan. Good Samaritan hospital. That's like in our culture, saying a good terrorist. To the Jewish mind, this is, this is a complete oxymoron. This don't go together. Now, Samaritans are not technically Gentiles. 
They're, they come from the same line, lineage, history, and family. And they obey the same Torah law, or at least they're supposed to. So the same Levitical code that would cause the priest and the Levite to pass by would or should apply to the Samaritan. But the key phrase is, he had compassion. The word there for compassion is the Greek word splagnizomai. It literally means like movement. <laughs> it, actually, it actually could be translated bowel movement, which sounds gross. It means deep guttural pain in the word for bowels, like deep inside. It's the same word when Jesus in, in Matthew 9 looks upon the crowds and sees that they are harassed and helpless and he had splagnizomai, compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Deep compassion. Move deep inside, like the inner groaning that, oh, this cannot stand. Last week you saw a video, I hope you saw it here, of, of, of Kim Erickson and Chris Anthony and their work with Naomi's house. If you talk to them, they'll tell you that it was that kind of deep compassion for these women and for this, the horrors of sex trafficking that caused them to want to go serve there. Like that, something inside you that's so deep and you just can't ignore it. It's not when you see a starving puppy on TV and you go, oh, that's sad, but you forget about it as soon as the show comes back on. It's seeing some injustice or something in the world and you, and you feel it so deep inside that you have to do something. You have to. That's the word. So why does the priest and the Levite pass by? They're rule-following religious people. No compassion. No deep inner angst over this man's plight. But for the, for the Samaritan, I can't ignore this. I can't pass by. I can't turn away. I remember years ago, a man came to me and wanted to make a donation to families in need, except he, he had a long list of qualifications for those families that he didn't want to support. I'm not kidding. We met for coffee, and he had a yellow pad, and he brought it out. He said, I'd like to give a generous donation to help families in need, but they can't be, and he had a whole list. They can't be undocumented citizens. It's on his list. They, they, they can't be um, unwilling to look for work. He had a whole long list of things. Now, some of those things are, I think I, I would say in a different conversation, we should talk about that with those families. But where in the Bible does it say, be generous and compassionate for the poor with these qualifiers? <laughs> right? I don't think that's in there. I've looked. I don't think it's in there. Maybe you know a verse I don't know about. Let me read to you what Jonathan Edwards wrote called The Duty of Charity. Uh, he, he, and it, now this is in the 1700s to his congregation in New England about why uh, they don't uh, want to be generous to the poor. Objection number one, I'll help only if they really need it. That we should relieve our neighbor only when in extremity is not agreeable to the rule of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Think about that. You want help even when you, it's not, Desperate, right? That rule implies that our love towards our neighbors should work in the same manner and express itself in the same ways as our love towards ourselves. We are very sensible of our own difficulties and needs. We should also be readily sensible of theirs. From love to ourselves, when we are under difficulties and suffer hardships, we are concerned for our relief and want to seek relief and lay ourselves out for it. And as we would love our neighbor as ourselves, we ought to, in like manner, be concerned when our neighbor is under such difficulty. Objection two. I'll help if they really deserve it. This is if you're the judge and jury of who deserves it. Listen to what Edwards writes. Christ hath loved us so as to be willing to deny himself and suffer greatly in order to help us. So should we be willing to deny ourselves in order to help one another. Christ loved us and showed us great kindness, though we were far below him. And we should show kindness to those who are beneath us. Christ denied himself to help us, though we are not able to recompense him. So we should be willing to lay ourselves out to help our neighbor, freely expecting nothing again. Christ loved and was kind to us and was willing to relieve us, though we were evil and hateful toward him. You get the idea. Objection three. I'll help if I can afford it. These are so contemporary, aren't they? I'll help if, if, if they need it, if they deserve it, and if I can afford it. How many of us haven't thought that? Maybe not said it out loud. Here's what Edwards writes. Remember Galatians 6, 2. We may, by the rules of the gospel, be obliged to give to others and we cannot do it without suffering ourselves. As if our neighbor's difficulties and necessities be much greater than our own. And we see that he is not like to be otherwise relieved. 
we should be willing to suffer with him and to take part of his burden on ourselves. How else is the rule of bearing one another's burdens to be fulfilled? If we be never obliged to relieve another's burdens, but that we can do it without burdening ourselves, then how do we bear our neighbor's burdens when we bear no burden at all? It's brilliant. Oh, only when I can afford it? How does that fulfill God's law of bear each other's burdens if it's not a burden to you? Like, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad in here. I'm trying to point out where I think the heart of this parable is really driving. We read verses 36 to 37 of the story. As it closes up here. Jesus finishes the story and then says, Which of these three do you think proved to be neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Jesus asks a very simple question here. Which of these three do you think proved to be neighbor to this man? Remember the man's question? Who is my neighbor? What is, how, Jesus turns it and asks, in effect, who is neighbor to you? Right? What do you, think about it for a minute. The key to getting this parable, and I missed this for years, is where does Jesus locate this man in the story? He's telling a story to answer the man's point. He's going to place the man, and he always does this for us as well. He's placing us in a story somewhere. Where does he place this man in the story? The traditional reading of the story is this. Don't be like the priest and the Levite. Be like the Samaritan. Go home and try hard to be a better person. I'm going to guess you walked in this morning thinking you need to be better than you are. How many of you walked in this morning thinking, nope, I'm fine just as I am? Anybody? How many of you think, I actually have some growing up to do? I have some spiritual formation that needs to happen in my life. I'm not as I should be fully. Anybody? How many of you aren't listening? Right? <laughs> you are now. Jesus asked this question. He's not saying, now go try hard to be better. That has no power to transform someone's life. That's just moralism. That's just, and there's secular and there's religious versions of moralism. Secular moralism is like a decent, progressive, enlightened person ought to have these views, do these things because it's good for society and that's how good people, you know, woke people, good people behave. Religious moralism, it's, there's different words, but it's the same basic heart. It's that the Bible, you know, the Quran, the Torah, they're telling us how to live, and if I behave this way, then God will bless me, and I'll be a righteous person, I'll be in the, the good side of a ledger. But it's just moralism. It doesn't change anybody's heart. The man wants to what? What does this expert in the law trying to do? To justify himself. And Jesus is trying to help him see that you cannot justify yourself. None of us can. You can't make yourself right by your own effort with God. If Jesus had told the parable this way, a man just like you was riding along and saw a Samaritan lying there, the expert would not have been moved at all. Samaritan deserves what he gets. He would never identify with the priest or the Levite because he was not from the tribe of Levi or the line of Aaron. He's not a priest or a Levite. Who's left? Well, three options. The donkey, the innkeeper, and the guy in the road. Right? Who's left in the story? The guy in the road. For years I missed this. For years I thought this story was about an obligation to be a better person. I think Jesus is putting that man and he's putting you and me in the road. The real power of the story is not that you should go home and try hard to be like the Good Samaritan. The real power of the story is that you are the half-naked, dying, bleeding man in the road spiritually speaking. You have no hope. You are going to bleed out. You are going to die. Your condition spiritually is hopeless unless somebody that, that owes you nothing should come along to your roadway and at great cost to himself save you. This is the gospel. The incarnation, Jesus comes into our dusty road, right? He comes into our broken world full of dying people spiritually. And he travels that road to find people who are spiritually bleeding out, who have no hope. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, you were without God and without hope in the world. Enemies of God in your hearts. Children of wrath. These are not phrases we like to say in our culture. But this is the condition we're in spiritually apart from God. 
Now on the outside we look fine, I'm doing great, I think I'm walking along like I'm just fine, but internally the Bible is saying you're not fine. You're, you're spiritually dead. Not mostly dead, like in The Princess Bride, but all dead. And a dead person cannot raise themselves. Only one could. You see the parable this way? If I just end it here, go home. Be like the, don't be like the priest or the Levite, be like the Samaritan. Ready? Be good. Yay, we're all going to try. That's not the power of the parable. The power of the parable, friends, is you're dying, and Jesus is your good Samaritan. He loves you that much. He sees you in your broken condition, and he has deep compassion, deep compassion for you and for me. When you sing, does that move you? Are you reminded of how much he loves you? He sees you, and he will not pass by. He comes to you. And at the cost of his life, he restores yours. He dies so you might live. It's the great exchange. He's rejected so you might be accepted. He's forsaken so you might be brought in. He's cut off so you might be engrafted, right? It's the great reversal. His life for yours. I use this analogy all the time, but it's so meaningful to me. I used to like to watch the, the Antique Roadshow on TV. Anybody watch the Antique Roadshow? People bring their stuff, you know, and an expert tells them what it's worth. Have you seen this? My favorite part is when they bring something they think is valuable and it's actually junk. I think that's funny, right? This is worthless. <laughs> but every now and then they bring something they don't know. They found their grandma's attic or at a garage sale or something, you know, in the garage. And they, and they bring it and the, the expert looks at it and goes, do you know what this is? This is an original whatever. And they tell them, they study it. And then like the little amount comes across the spot on the screen, bring $50,000, you know, whatever. And, it's, and they're, they're shocked. How does the expert know what the thing's worth? Are they just making up numbers? How do they know? It's not a trick question. Some of you know this. How do they know what that item is worth? They know what someone is willing to pay. They've seen it go at auction for this. They've seen someone pay this. And so they know what someone's willing to pay. How do you know the value of a human life? What is the value of human life? What's it worth? Unborn life? Life at the end? With days to live? All life. What's it worth? Well, what, what, is, what is God willing to pay for it? What is the price he's willing, the extent he's willing to go? The ultimate price. You are of infinite worth to God. Everyone you meet is of infinite worth to God. This is the power of the parable. That that's how God sees you. Helpless, dying, and he loves you. When that gets inside your mind and heart, you become the kind of person who can't pass by on the other side. I'm not always there. I sometimes pass by and so do you. But the, the path to becoming that kind of man or woman is not trying hard to be better. It's coming back to the recognition that that's how much he loves me. That's what he's done for me. And when that seeps from here into here, then you become the kind of person who can't pass by. I, I can't ignore that. Doesn't matter to me if you're a documented citizen or not. Doesn't matter to me if you deserve it or not. Because I didn't deserve it, but he saved me. And he saved you. And he wants to save you. And the beautiful thing about the gospel is he wants to use us to go find people who are dying in the roadway. Literally, and metaphorically, in every way. This is radical free grace. He found you on your road. It cost him his life. He's restored you to life. Now join him in this journey. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we worship you for your grace. We say those words, but we rarely pause to think of what that means. Lord Jesus, some of us have been walking with you for a long time. We've been around the church for a long time. We're steeped in traditions and in knowledge. And sometimes that gets in our way of truly understanding what you have done and who you are. Remind us this morning in a fresh way that we are no different. We are broken people in desperate need of your grace. And because of your deep compassion, love, your sacrifice on the cross and your resurrection from the grave, you've restored us to life. You've given us hope and purpose. We thank you for that and we praise you in your name. Amen.